Okay, well, we're going to get started now on the fourth of these NOVAC planning uh, for the solar eclipse sessions. This is the April 2023 session, and welcome everybody. Um, we have some other people talking, which I'm glad to see this time, uh, and, and you people may be glad to see it too um, with, today's, with today's discussion. Um, got some announcements at the beginning. Um, then we have Jeff Ball, who did a nice job putting together a video of, the, of his experience of 2017, which has one kind of a view of, of eclipse photography. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, Charlie Bradshaw talk about his highly portable eclipse setup and his experiences in 2017. Both Jeff and Charlie are NOVAC members, and we appreciate their contributing to the, to the program. Uh, I had some slides on an overview of what can be photographed. I think with Jeff and Charlie's presentations, we may not get through uh, much of that, but that's okay. Whatever overflows will continue as we talk more about astrophotography next month. And then uh, I want to end up with a little bit of time for discussion about what we should cover in future sessions, what the emphasis should be. Um, what people haven't heard so far, what they want to hear again, uh, and what we can do as a club, which is a continuing issue uh, for these discussions. It's not supposed to be just training on how to get ready for the eclipse, but uh, are there things we want to do collectively? And uh, as before, um, it's probably easiest if you indicate any time through here that, that you've got a question uh, through the chat, and, uh, and we'll take a break at a logical point and get to that question or discussion that you want to bring up. Um, a couple of things which have happened since the last meeting. The uh, handouts are, are ready to describe particularly the aspects of the 2023 partial solar eclipse. Uh, Dan Ward and Chris Kagey did a lot of work on that, and they'll be ready for the upcoming NOVAC activities. We've got three in close succession. We've got uh, a public event at Blue Ridge out uh, beyond Leesburg this Saturday. We have Astronomy Day on the 22nd at Rocket. And we've got Astronomy for All, which is also this Saturday on the 15th. And we should, uh, we'll have copies of the handouts We'll start passing those out at public events to make people aware, in particular, of what's going to be happening this fall with the partial eclipse here, as it's viewable here. Of course, 2024 will also be a partial eclipse here. Uh, we'll have a probably a slightly different handout as we approach that in April. Uh, we just got word today, and you can see a handout from Julie Amoth, uh, that the Night Sky Network has a talk coming up on the 27th about the scientific contributions from total solar eclipses. This very nice picture that I've uh, pasted in uh, is an example of what high dynamic range uh, photography with very high quality cameras, uh, professional quality cameras and telescopes can do and reveal the detailed structure of, of the corona uh, during the course of a total eclipse, which from end to end lasts about six hours. Uh, if multiple people take high dynamic range, uh, high dynamic range imagery, you can watch the dynamics of the corona and that can be analyzed. So that's the kind of thing that'll be discussed in that talk from uh, JPL and Astronomical Society, uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Um, Woody Davis and some of the other members are um, working on finding sponsors for NOVAC to. Uh, provide viewing glasses in the community. Uh, I didn't put it down here, but basically he's talking to uh, our, our friends at MITRE, my employee, employer, his employer, Zach Panitsky's employer, quite a few members of the club are employees of MITRE and, uh, and their executives are somewhat interested in, in getting sunglasses to the community. Uh, it would help if somebody in this group were to volunteer the two, the two kinds of topics we need help with um, or areas we need help with, probably someone to do a, a custom design 
that reflects Novak and the sponsor and the, the nature of the eclipse. That's one option we have. And then someone who would just help out with ordering, assuming this comes to fruition and taking care of the logistics of, of getting it from, from one of the vendors. Um, anybody wants to raise your hand or, uh, or volunteer now, that would be great, but we'll come, we'll come chasing people at some point. Uh, another item is that we have posted all the material from these sessions and some material on uh, information that people have suggested as good references on the Novak Drive site. The, uh, the shortened URL is bit.ly, TSE 2024, Total Solar Eclipse 2024. So that should be easy to remember. And I was hoping I could get to it. Let's see if that works. Okay, I've Is got a yours? directory. Okay. Uh, yep, if you can click on resources and click on sky, this um, this answers one of the questions that somebody had last week. It's You can look at it more carefully uh, on your own, but someone said, what will the sky look like during the eclipse? And um, just for reference, you can see the eclipse sun um, this is just the southern quadrant of the sky. So the eclipse sun in the early afternoon would be east, uh, I'm sorry, west of south uh, with a fairly good elevation. And the bright objects which will be visible during the eclipse are uh, Mars, Saturn, lowest, Venus, closer to the sun, and Jupiter on the far side up there. And Orion will be up. Now, usually during the eclipse, you see about second magnitude, maybe third magnitude stars. You don't see the dim stars because the sky is not totally bright. Mercury will be up, but it's uh, approaching inferior conjunction. So even though it's on the map, it would be very dim and, and not visible. Okay, so we can go back to the slides. Um, and we, we did receive word a while back that the folks from the Texas Star Party are trying to make a, uh, a little star party for the eclipse. We haven't heard an update from them. Uh, the last we heard it was gonna be someplace near Waco and uh, it was gonna be a one price package for four days or something like that. But they apparently haven't uh, completed it. So uh, completed their arrangements. So next we have Jeff, uh, who's going to talk about the eclipse both via his video and via his discussion afterwards, we hope. So um, Jeff is a member of the club. Uh, he's a professional photographer and blogger. He has a website that everybody is welcome to go look at. It's got great stuff on it. Earthandskyphoto.com. That's easy enough to remember. Um, and I think Pamela's got the video, so we'll, we'll go to that. Jeff, do you want to start, uh, introduce it, go off mute? Yes, Alan, thank you. And okay. yeah, I'd like to preface this. You may have had this conversation in previous Eclipse uh, Zoom interactions, but when I was planning on going to this Eclipse, I had no plans to do photography, of course, all of the consensus is, if this is your first eclipse, you really don't want to complicate the event. You really want to just visually take it in, whether it's naked eye or binoculars or telescopic. And that was really the path I was going down. And I have a good uh, astro imaging friend, Brent Maynard. He's also online on YouTube and he's my tech guy. He does all of my camera modifications and he can he has no problem digging into the, the the innards of a Canon camera and doing the Canon modification. But he, he came up with, um, and if you want to go ahead and start the video pan, that'd be great. Um, I'll just kind of talk through some of it. We were outside of Teleco Plains, Tennessee. My daughter lived in Maryville, Tennessee at the time. And that's Brent 
um, that you could see walking toward the, I think this was a, um, a wide angle um, GoPro camera. Uh, and this is just me introducing the video. What I set up here, Pam was, uh, and Alan was, Alan, um, Saul Morose was one of our accompanying people on the on the trip. And Saul and I go way back to a lot of winter star parties. And this was his first total solar eclipse. And he passed away about a year later. So it really is just um, my message to those who, and I think we all share this same camaraderie around a total, total solar eclipse. People need to go to totality to experience it and don't miss out on it. And th th that's just kind of part of my messaging at the beginning of this, uh, this, but so I had no plans to image, but Brent Maynard came up with this automated system that really required no attention on our part to man, the, to, to, to be at the scope and control the exposures. And I think Alan's going to probably get into this in future. And he, he said, in the, there's no way to cover all this photographically in an hour, all the options that you have, how to capture the eclipse. Alan's presentation of the sky during the eclipse only opens up wide angle opportunities. I can see there for a great uh, totality coverage in a wide angle, no telescope. But what Brent came up with was an automated system. We were using modified Canon. I think I was using a T5i. I might have that notated incorrectly in certain spots, but it was a Canon camera. We were using Magic Lantern in association with some other eclipse timing, very accurate timing systems that did all of the calculated exposures automatically. We never had, if you'll watch here, once all I had to do was uncover the scope when we when we got into totality. So on the left is my five inch refractor on an astrophysics mount and a pier. Um, we had, I think Brent had a 200 millimeter focal length lens. The far right are my binoculars, my seven by fifties with solar eclipse filters on those. And that was absolutely spectacular. It was a great way to view the eclipse and gives you a sense of what features you're at should be able to see. And this was the first time I really could see the, the major prominences that were happening during this eclipse. And so this is the wide angle GoPro. Um, everything's count down. If you listen to the audio, go back and listen to this audio. You can hear the cameras with certain uh, triggering sounds that tell you what phase of the eclipse that you're in. Uh, what contact point, whether it's shooting for exposures for the diamond ring effect or shooting multiple layered exposures for the corona. You know, it'll go from two seconds down to, I think, probably some of our shortest were maybe one two thousandth of a second. I, I think I got notes on that somewhere, but huge dynamic range. This was what we did in 2017. Um, as you can see, we're not met. We're not managing the scopes and the image taking at all. We're enjoying the solar eclipse, uh, both naked eye and through the binoculars. And that was a key criteria for me. If, if, if Brent had not come up with this way to sync Magic Lantern to do this exposure capture automated, all automatically, then I was just going to visually take in the eclipse through the scope. So... But 2024 is going to be my second eclipse. <laughs> so we're all in on planning. I'm glad Alan invited me to do this because um, <clears throat> this will really, you can see wide angle. You can, this is a very low sensitivity um, GoPro camera. I think what this was Mercury at the time, I believe. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna revisit all my data and see if I can do this better with a high dynamic range. I actually think that image represents visually pretty uh, what the corona looks like visually. Um, that was with the five inch refractor, and I think I composited about six exposures for that. I've got a couple of resources I'm going to put in the chat that I think are worth checking out over the next year. But I thank Alan for getting me into this because it certainly helped to spearhead me to start my investigation into what is it 
uh, we're going to do. And of course, this was the prominence, the major prominence. Uh, this was uh, through one of the shorter exposures, probably the one thousandth of a second exposure with the uh, five inch refractor with the Canon uh, T5i. And that was very, once we saw it in the binoculars, I think Brent's pointing it out. It was naked eye. You could see that the major prominence, and I think one other naked eye. Uh, just, it's an amazing experience. I'm sure everyone on here, you're you're on here because you know this is a special experience. So it's going to be my second eclipse, and we are hard in the planning stages uh, of what we're going to do next time. This is now seven years ago, right? Uh, so technology changes, image acquisition techniques change. What your focus, what you want to capture as an imager could change. Uh, again, I want to reinforce, I would not make the image taking just detract in any way from you enjoying the eclipse, uh, either naked eye or with, uh, I think binoculars are a great way or telescopically visually to take in, to take in the event. So we're celebrating, man. We just, we had a great time. There was, uh, there were a lot of people there and teleco planes um, that had set up. There were fireworks that went off to indicate when, uh, I think we were mid totality. So it was very successful and uh, we, we had a good time. This is Saul and uh, his wife, Elaine and Brent Maynard up on the, uh, I think one up on the Blue Ridge Parkway somewhere, uh, or maybe the uh, Highland Scenic Highway uh, down that way in Tennessee. So it was a great experience. And um, we are working, I just talked with Brent today about where we think this goes in terms of technique, equipment, uh, and image capturing capabilities. Unfortunately, that high dynamic, it would be ideal to have a high dynamic range, 4K, 8K video grabbing system that you didn't have to do all of these calculated exposures to, uh, to capture the, uh, the full dynamic range. But we can get into those techniques. I'm going to put in the chat a link to someone who kind of gets overlooked, but some of us senior people know his name very well. New people may not, but it's Jerry Rodriguez. He's at astropix.com. He has a lot of techniques and tutorials, and he goes into his uh, solar eclipse capturing technique. He actually uses a, he used at this time a, a Mac based program. So you, if you're if you can have a computer talk to your camera, it's called Solar Eclipse Maestro, and that I just checked out their website. They say the next update is coming March of 2024. So they are waiting until the last moment to update their software. But that's Solar Eclipse Maestro, Alan. If I could, I'd suggest maybe in a, I'll get my act together here and we'll start doing some research. And maybe in about three four months maybe really kind of revisit this and do a real deep dive into uh, techniques to consider, equipment to consider, uh, where, where the technology has us and um, software, software image capture techniques and things like that. Maybe even break it down into subgroups. You know, those who want to use telescopic capture, those who want to do wide field capture, um, video only capture, it, it's, it can go so many directions. Um, but um, that's that's my experience. I hope uh, I hope that was worthwhile and of value to you. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think that's just the kind of thing we'd like to do in the next couple of sessions, or and maybe wait a while. Uh, I think the the uh, solar eclipse maestro is one of the things that's listed in the. Um, I'm not sure if it's on my reference list that I've posted already, but certainly on the software reference from the American Astronomical Society website. Okay. Um, and, and there've been some things which we'll, we'll talk about when we talk about software, not tonight. Um, Solar Eclipse Orchestrator, which I presume one of them took the name from the other, but um, which is for Windows. Um, that's not being supported anymore. And that apparently was very popular for Windows-based people. So going to have to be looking for something else. Now, um, Charlie is going to talk about what he used, which is a product that still is in production. 
But before we leave this, does anybody have any questions or comments or things they want to ask Jeff uh, before we move on to Charlie? Oh, this is Greg. Um, let me turn on my video. Sorry. Thanks okay. for the presentation. And I've seen a lot of your videos in the past and they're very, very professional and, and very interesting. Uh, I, I was curious, you, you had, I think you said a T5I on the back of your five inch, uh, I guess, a, a probably a, a 130 on your, on your mount. Uh, as I remember, the cannons don't have the ability to do uh, native um, uh, time lapse photography. Uh, I did it with a Nikon. I know we're getting into the weeds, but I'm just kind of curious of how you overcame that. On the Nikon, it's got not only a time lapse, but it also has the bracketing. So essentially, you set the time lapse to take five or seven uh, um, frames for each time it takes a picture, and then it goes through the bracketing sequence. So it automatically does uh, your bracketing for you and does the time lapse at the same time. How did you accomplish that with your experience? Thank you, Greg, for the comments on the videos. And that was where this magic lantern came into play. That is a firmware that kind of resides on top of the Canon firmware. I think it's almost exclusively Canon. I don't know if um, Magic Lantern has been made for any other manufacturer, but the Magic Lantern came out with a special subset. It's amazing what Magic Lantern can do on a camera. Far more, far more features than I know how to use, but they had a specific eclipse feature that synced up with a geo-specific timer. And it knew exactly when first contact, uh, you know, mid-totality, and it was automatically doing those exposures. It wasn't, it wasn't even doing a bracketing. It just knew it needed to, it, we were at mid-eclipse and we were going to capture the corona at two seconds of exposure. I think you had some user input into how wide the dynamic range you wanted to be. And you, you set your ISO probably, and that helped dictate it. But it was all automated through a firmware program called Magic Lantern for Canon. And we did nothing. Yeah, it was all, all synced up with an Eclipse timer software that we had also. Well, uh, thanks, Jeff. I was, uh, it sounded almost like you had a, uh, had a computer hooked up to it. And I just wondered if it was self-contained in the camera or whether you had some kind of, what, yeah. what you used to augment it with. So did it require a, uh, a computer as well, or it just relied on the firmware in the camera? You're the only, you do have to have a computer to format uh, the uh, disc, you know, the um, SD card that you're putting in the camera. Okay. That's the only time you need a, a laptop is to put Magic Lantern on the SD card. And once it boots up off of that SD card, it's loaded on the camera. So it is in the camera itself. Wow. Well, thanks very much. Sorry to take everybody down a rabbit hole, but I just didn't understand the lash up and this is very helpful. No, that's, that, that's a good question. And, um, it's interesting that that works entirely within the camera, because um, uh, Charlie is going to talk about a different a different uh, application, and I've been looking at some of them which do require external computers. Um, the the one I mentioned before, Solar Eclipse Orchestrator, um, replaces the bracketing. You put all the bracketing in manually that you want to do. Uh, and similar to what Jeff just described, it syncs to the time of, of second contact and does your bracketing reference to second contact for your location. And maybe one of the reasons that the upgrade's going to update will be just a month before the next eclipse 
there is a few seconds of ambiguity in the prediction based on the cumulative rotation of the earth. It's a, it's a subtle effect, but the predictions come out based on an assumption that the earth is rotating at a uniform rate. It actually doesn't rotate at a uniform rate. So there's a last minute correction of a few seconds based on what the rotation has actually been. And uh, that may be what Eclipse Maestro is waiting for. That's the ephemeris time correction. It's got a new name now. Um, okay. So if there aren't any more questions directly for Jeff, I don't know if he's going to be able to hang around, but let's move on to um, Charlie Bradshaw's presentation. And um, I have the slides for that. So Charlie, why don't you start with an introduction to, um, to what you're going to be showing? Uh, yeah, I, Jeff and I have a lot in common. It, it was my first eclipse as well. And, uh, and it was in Tennessee at uh, Falls Creek Falls, Falls State Park. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the, the things that I, I did was I said, I want to photograph this eclipse, but I also want to look at it. And I built, a, put together kind of a, a cheap uh, camera setup, which you, I'll be describing as I go along. And that, that setup was basically this, very similar to what Jeff described, except it wasn't in the camera. I did have a computer hooked up to it and uh, used a program to do it. Now, again, all I had to do was uh, polar align, center the, uh, the, the sun with obviously with a uh, filter on and, uh, and track it across the sky and let the, uh, the computer uh, take all the shots and then beep at me to take the uh, filter off. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what I used was a, a T, Canon T3 DSLR and a 200 millimeter telephoto lens uh, on it. Uh, I, I happen to have a Vixen Polari tracking mount. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's a, uh, you know, it just mounts on a tripod and it just, it does solar, lunar, or uh, stellar tracking. Uh, that compass with an inclinometer on it is the way I, uh, all you have to do is know your latitude and longitude and your offset of your magnetic north. And you can use that for polar alignment. And that's what I did for daylight polar alignment when I set up the, uh, in the field. And I had a pinhole projector for fine alignment uh, or fine pointing. It's really what an alignment. Uh, I, uh, the solar filter, of course, was on the lens for taking the photos before the eclipse. And then the uh, program was called Sit and See, and it's only for Canon. And, and it does pretty much what J uh, Jeff described that his, uh, his software was doing. And it, it essentially uh, controls the, uh, the exposure and the timing on the, uh, on the imaging. Uh, obviously I had a, just a regular camera tripod, a little, uh, I had a, a, a $3 plastic bucket for a computer shade and a table and a seat to, to be able to work at the computer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'm showing here is, uh, see that fine positioning? That is nothing but a, uh, a 3D printed, uh, basically a point onto a white screen in the back so that you can point at the sun uh, using the, uh, the flash mount and uh, you, you have the sun projected into the rear onto a white screen. And that's how you do your fine positioning. And I described the uh, inclinometer and the uh, compass for polar alignment before. Now focus. 
that that's a good one. Uh, focusing, uh, you can't focus with a filter on, worth a darn. You definitely don't want to focus on the sun uh, when <laughs> when you have the filter off. So uh, I I I fortunately I took something that was about a half a mile off a tree and did the focus on the tree before I uh, uh, before I uh, put on the filter after I'd set it up, just tilting it. But it it focus is always going to be an issue. Now I did practice a lot, so I knew a, a very very close focus point for infinity uh, by you know focusing on stars and such. But uh, but it's getting the exact focus take, is, a, is a trial with that setup. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Charlie, is that uh, your, your, uh, your pointing device? Did that sit in the hot shoe? Yes. Ah, okay. it's, it's, just a, it's just a 3D printed piece of plastic that has a uh, pinhole up front and a, a white uh, reflective uh, screen in the back. I was just wondering how you got it lined up with the lens. So you 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 just took the um, the hot shoe alignment. Yes, that good. was basically it. But it it, it I I uh, obviously I can with the filter on. I know where the sun is in the camera because I can. I'm uh, all I'm doing is moving the uh, the sun to the center of the camera by using that shoe instead of mm -hmm. trying to sit behind in the computer. So I can move it uh, using the shoe. Then uh, if I look at the screen on the computer to see where I'm shooting, and then I can adjust it a little bit one way or the other to center up the sun. Uh, I, it's, uh, you notice I, I, I'm in a state park. That's my uh, to Toyota in the back, right in front of a bathroom. And I, I, uh, I think position is everything. For it. So I wanted to sit up so I could be close to a restroom, but that was my setup. Uh, the wagon, I was, I was, uh, had an RV and I, uh, the wagon was what I used to carry everything from the RV to the field. The RV of course is back in the trees. So, uh, so that, that was our setup for uh, the field uh, and that little, uh, Celestron battery pack was all the all the power I would need for several days for the camera, uh, and the uh, and the computer battery was fully charged too. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, polar alignment. Well, uh, you know I told you how I did it with the inclinometer and the uh, and the uh, uh, and the compass. But you know, true north is not always where the compass points, and I think I was just a little bit off because <clears throat> I, the sun was drifting out of my field of view, and I was forced to repoint the camera, uh, which I really wanted one of those pretty alignment sequences that you show uh, on the on the start of this when you send out. But unfortunately, because I had to readjust my camera to center the uh, center of the sun. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to get a whole movie together, but that was just, you know, that was a mistake I made. And hopefully I'll be more careful when it comes around next year. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, I, these are just some of the results I got. Uh, actually, for the first time to ever see an eclipse and to take images of the eclipse, I was extremely happy with my results. Uh, I got good corona pictures. I got uh, some of the flaring, uh, not as much, but, uh, but I was very happy with the output. And I'll show you. Uh, the diamond ring uh, that I got, that's all right, go ahead, next result. The diamond ring I got was uh, was good, but then the next picture I got 
which uh, uh, almost, I, I was lucky it didn't burn my camera <laughs> because I had forgot to put the filter back on because uh, I was so interested in getting more of the diamond ring. And, uh, but it, it, it survived. I still use that uh, Canon uh, uh, all the time. And uh, that, is, that is basically my setup. Uh, I did go out on my deck and set it up. I, I, I must have set it up 20 times with the filter on just practicing. And uh, yeah, yeah, you can go ahead into the next slide. And uh, so I'm going to still plan on using sit and see uh, to do the same thing next year. Uh, here, I, uh, I put the, the link up there, but uh, Alan has already put it in, in the link there and the resort, the uh, AAS resources uh, were, is a good one. And, uh, and that's basically, unless there's questions, all I have to talk about. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Anybody have any questions for, uh, for Charlie? I mean, I have one comment. I did the same thing for getting to put the uh, the filter back on my camera because I was so excited and doing other things. And uh, mine tracked for two hours with the sun burning a hole on it, and it didn't do anything to the uh, to the focal plane. Luckily, so yeah. Well, it didn't. That was damage a real it. test. <laughs> it didn't damage mine, but I was I was really afraid it would. Yeah, I was also because. I'm from the old days. I remember some cameras with focal plane shutters, and they would have been flames uh, with the sun focused on it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so you made the choice, uh, and the the set and see, as I understand it, you programmed in. Did you program in manually all the exposures? Uh, actually, sit and see has got uh, it, all you. You tell it where you want it, and it knows when the eclipse is. Uh, uh, I, I, it made recommendations for the exposures, but uh, you, I, I did program. I, I selected what I wanted, and uh, but I, I based it on the sit and see controls and and uh, for the camera. Uh, there's a lot of information about it on this uh, way, uh, this web page. But the web page. And uh, what did you what did you use for the uh, stacking afterwards and the uh, and the HDR processing? Oh, I use PixInsight. Okay, and that and that handles the. Uh, I'm not that familiar with PixInsight, but uh, well, you 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 can use several uh i i actually i i use several things to stack but pix insight uh i i did a lot of the processing uh in pix insight and then when i did the stacking uh i believe i used uh, oh i'm 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 drawing a blank right now i think i used Two different programs to do the stacking, and one of them was uh, Pix Insight, but the other one was um, what is it? Uh, it's a planetary stacking program that almost everybody uses. Uh, Astro Stacker? No, uh, yeah. Uh, well, Astro Stacker or or the other one? Uh, Registack. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dan. <laughs> and and, and did, that do the, did that do the HDR, the high dynamic range? Uh, uh, it didn't do it as, as well as PixInsight, but okay. it, it, it did the stacking. And then I went into PixInsight and did uh, 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 the more of the high dynamic range adjustments. Because uh, actually, AutoStacker and Registax both can do high dynamic high dynamic range, but Pix Insight being 32, I mean, you know, just because of the uh, computational capability of it, I think is a little bit better. 
you can yeah. get really really get down the weeds with fixed insight. Okay, and and one of the things I've been thinking about recently, and I got to ask the uh, the astro imagers now that everyone takes um, subframes, why? Um, what what would that mean for a solar eclipse? So it's it's like the thing of why would I want to take a two or five second exposure, which the inner corona is going to be blown out. Um, if I could just take a whole bunch of very short exposures and have them stacked for the outer corona, but just use the shortest ones for the inner. I, I don't know if any software supports that. Yeah, go back up, uh, Alan, uh, about three slides. One more. Yeah, there. So these uh, over here on the right are the stacked outputs. Those are right. short. Those are subframes stacked. Over on the left is the single image. So yeah, I, I did, a, I did uh, short subframes, and I, I actually stacked them. Uh, so, uh, these are, these are some of the results now on the, on the top one, uh, I probably, uh, set the black point a little bit too high, but the bottom one, uh, actually pulls out more information. Mm -hmm. And, and if, it, if you expanded it up, you could see some of the, uh, uh, Corona, the red Corona around the edges as well but they would be merged together because they were subs that were stacked. And, and I tried different uh, combinations of, of stack subs with different sub, sub exposures as well. But if you go over to the, the left side, that's just a single uh, unstacked image right there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking in the old days with film, you didn't really have the option for stacking. No, so we yeah. took long exposures and short exposures mm -hmm. and did short and did uh, yeah. These, processing tricks to combine. Yeah. But now that where you have subs and low noise readout, I was wondering about that because you uh, also have the time it takes to to read out the the chip to the memory, which actually, is it's it's not that long. It's I mean, not very long, but it is if if you only have a couple of minutes at the eclipse. It, yeah, well, I had full four point. minutes. I yeah. was in the okay. I was in the center. Okay. I do think it's interesting, as as Jeff pointed out earlier, that this 2017. Okay, that was six plus years ago. Uh, it's going to be interesting with the Australian eclipse coming up next week uh, as a first one with really some of the newer technology for imaging. So uh, I I think we'll see a lot of lessons learned coming out soon. Yeah. Well, my lesson is I've stopped learning at my old age, and I'll use the same stuff I used the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe I'll put the filter on quicker. One of the things that um, um, Eclipse Orchestrator does, I believe, is you can put a wave file in. You program you program a quick statement and have it talk to you and say. Take the filter off, put the filter on, at the right at the right time during the eclipse. Yeah, uh, sit and see. I don't think uh, does that, but it did. Uh, you do program it to beep at you. Oh, it can beep. Okay. Yeah, it, it can warn you that it's time to take it off or and put it back on. But I was I was so interested. I was out looking and I'd forgotten. You know how it goes. Yep. Yeah, the excitement of the moment. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Charlie. No Anybody problem. else have any questions, discussions about Charlie's stuff? Okay. Oh, this, this is Greg again. I just want to mention that uh, although he's in a difficult position, Charlie's in a difficult position because he's so close to the ground. Uh, I had good success looking at the uh, LCD for the live view and using it on full magnification and then using one of those LCD hoods that had a little bit of magnification and then focusing on the sunspots or on the terminus uh, of, the, uh, of the object in the, uh, 
in the scope or even 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 autofocus worked when I was hand holding hand holding a uh, eighty to four hundred millimeter with the uh, Nikon D five hundred. Um, so uh, yeah, hey, it, I, I didn't I didn't have the uh, the thing that I could rotate. You know the uh, live view. I have live view on the back of that T three, but it's uh, you still have to get on the ground to look through it. Right, that's a, that's a problem, and it but it does point to some of the features that are very helpful for a uh, for an eclipse. Oh yeah, yeah. I just too cheap. Charlie, do do you use backyard EOS, and did you consider using that for the eclipse? I I do have backyard EOS. And I did consider it uh, for the eclipse, uh, especially for focusing. And if I if I uh, uh, I use uh, I like it for the way it, I can focus the Canon uh, lens with it, but uh, I didn't want to uh, be switching back and forth. Right. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of practicing to get it into a routine and to connect up uh, backyard EOS and then use it for part of it and then switch programs in the middle of the stream, I felt was too risky. But that was because I didn't know what I was doing at that time. But I still probably would think it was a little risky, but I, I do have it and I could, and I did think about using it, but decided not to. Okay, but well, you did compare at least in your mind, you you decided that the uh, set and C was a better way to go. Uh, yes, because yeah. of the timing and the way, it, uh, you know, you could probably program Backyard EOS to do very much the same thing. And one of the nice things about Backyard EOS, uh, you could have got a one per one, one pixel for, you know, per arc second. You could have actually got better resolution by using it instead of taking just the regular frames. Uh, but I, again, I was, it was chancy. I would have been having to do a 5X uh, on it uh, to get the edges. And I, I just didn't want to take the chance with a short time frame. Yeah, okay. All right, well. Um... Um, there's a question in the chat from Eugene about how fine focus of the sun is achieved. Uh, well, the, the fine focus of the sun is not hard to do if you've got sunspots. Uh, but uh, in my case, what I did was I, I focused on a distant object, you know, about a mile away and used that for my infinity focus uh, because I'd be, uh, I wouldn't, I didn't want to change the focus any time during the uh, session, and uh, and it it worked out pretty well. Uh, but you know, if you're if you've got a filter on, and you focus with the filter on, there's no guarantee, and you'll be in better focus with the filter once you take the filter off. So I I did a distance focus with the filter on, put the filter on uh, with the filter off. I'm sorry. Uh, and then once I had it focused, I just put the filter on and left it, left the same focus the whole time. And then when I took it off, filter off during the eclipse, I was theoretically a little bit better focused through infinity. Uh, and the results seemed to bear up. It looked like I was in pretty good focus. If you... Uh, yeah, that's it's, it's a good point that you can't trust precise focus with the filter. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't believe the focus through the filter would be uh, as good as uh, a focus on a distant tree or object that you, uh, that was at least a mile away to allow you to get in infinite focus. Charlie, what kind of uh, filter did you use? It was a uh, Thousand Oaks. Uh, White filter. Uh, uh, is that a, a glass filter or is that a film filter? It's a glass filter. Okay, then I think your your concern is probably. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. 
I didn't I didn't want to use a film filter because I didn't know how well it would stand up. And you know, I didn't want to I didn't want any filter with holes in it. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to move on, let's see, a little bit. I had many slides because I, I wasn't fully, I wasn't sure when I was getting ready for tonight that uh, Jeff and Charlie would be available and uh, to, to speak to us. So I have an hour's worth of slides, which I'm obviously not going to do. I, I'm going to start a little bit and then go into the discussion um, about just generally what people think we should be doing in future sessions. So with that, um, I'm going to re reiterate partially because it builds on things that Jeff said. Um, the, the opportunity you have to photograph the people around you without any kind of a special camera, it can be video, it can be stills, because recording the sounds we didn't hear his video. We heard his description of his video. But if you actually go back and um, and listen to his video, you'll hear the recording of the people in the vicinity as the eclipse goes on. And that itself is interesting in their reaction after the eclipse, especially first timers. So that's always a thing you can do. And it doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, you can use an old video camera. You can use a... Um, a trail cam, and well, not a trail cam, but a um, a sports cam of some sort. Uh, you can put it on a tripod, leave it unattended, and just capture capture the moment so you so you remember it again. Um, that's something easy to do. Um, as as Charlie described, he he tried to set up to take stills of the partial phases to make sort of a, either a time lapse or a mosaic. People do both. I think Dan Ward has been very successful producing a mosaic. Um, very often what people do is they take a series of individual stills and then generate the mosaic after the fact um, because the sun actually moves quite a bit between first contact and fourth contact, when the moon just begins to touch the sun and when the moon last leaves the sun. It's about two hours, a little bit longer between first and fourth contact. So the entire, the combination of the sun and moon are moving 30 degrees. 30 degrees is 60 diameters. So that's fairly widely spaced out and is not gonna make a very, uh, compact composite when you when you do that. So people take the individual stills and then put them together in darkroom processing. Um, although you can leave it with a wide with a wide angle um, and record it throughout maybe more frequently and get an idea of the sequence. But but remember you're mainly seeing the sun move across the sky and you're not seeing so much of the eclipse. Um, doing that does require positioning. And if, if you're tracking the sun for the mosaic, as Charlie mentioned, you do have to be a little bit careful uh, if you want to do it unattended to get your polar alignment right so that you track the sun for two hours without it drifting out of your field of view. We'll talk in the future about selecting focal lengths and uh, what's optimal for the partial phases and what's optimal for the corona, uh, getting the right scale or the right uh, fill on your on your focal plane. But usually you want a fairly long lens so that you get good resolution during totality. And that means it's a bit tricky to make sure you're tracking. You can track it for, uh, for two hours. Uh, and obviously you take the partial phases with a filter and you do totality without it. Uh, if you take a long exposure of the totality without the filter and you have a wide field of view and the sun is fairly close to the horizon, you can get a scenic. Uh, and when, um, if Jeff comes back and talks about his experiences in getting photography 
of astronomical events in the environment, which he's very good at. He'll, he'll probably talk about some of those issues. But the exposure time during totality to get the outer corona is probably long enough to also get the scenery around you. So that's a consideration. The other thing, which went by very quickly on, on uh, Jeff's video, he did something very clever. Um, the, the pinhole imaging of the partial eclipse, uh, which creates crescents if you make a pinhole image. Conventionally, what people have done is either held a, um, a colander, which you use for pasta uh, with, with a lot of little holes in it, or in some cases, the natural pinholes that uh, are made by combinations of leaves and trees will create crescent images on the ground of the partial sun, a partially eclipsed sun. Um, what Jeff did was he used a Ritz cracker that had, what, six or seven baking holes in it. And uh, I don't know if you paid attention, but if you look at this at the video again, you'll see the crescents being formed in the shadow of the uh, of the Ritz cracker. Um, and that's just a general photograph of the sun being imaged on the ground. So no special exposure for that. Um, you can try to take a picture of the approaching departing shadow. Uh, some of these th topics we talked about before when we talked about viewing the eclipse. Now we're saying things you can do to photograph the eclipse. Same thing, it depends on your location, whether you have a clear view of, of the distance um, and somehow the shadow changes the, the ground brightness enough from your location that you can see it coming or going. Uh, and it depends on the atmosphere, whether the darkness uh, contrasts with the brightness around the shadow and how close you are to the edge of the shadow uh, at your particular location. I'm not saying go to the edge of the shadow just so you can see it um, because you'd have a short uh, a short duration of totality. Uh, shadow bands are something else in the environment. Those are difficult to photograph because they're very low contrast. They're, it's something which is often easier to see visually because your eye is good at detecting motion and the camera is not good at detecting, the still camera is not good at detecting motion. So uh, typically you wanna have brought along a flat white screen on which the contrast will be best for the shadow bands if they appear, holding it perpendicular to the direction to the sun and then take photographs of it uh, and process it for high contrast. Uh, I showed this video before, I'm gonna skip over it of some examples of uh, the, the top was, um, actually illuminating the differences in brightness. And the lower one shows um, how the light is surrounding you even when you're in darkness. And this was a video I'm not gonna show again. Uh, this is a shadow bands illustration. Um, on the right is an example of the kind of screen which this uh, expedition to Egypt used, I think it's one of the illuminized screens that you might use in your car to keep it dark, to, to keep it in shade uh, on a sunny day. And the bottom is the highly stretched image that finally revealed the shadow bands, which were actually present on the top photo, but um, very difficult to see. Uh, the other advantage in using the, the uniform illuminized or white screen is that you can stretch the contrast quite a bit um, because it's intrinsically very uniform and therefore see the shadow bands. And I think I'm gonna wrap it up with that. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna skip ahead a bunch. Okay, and reiterating what Jeff said, what Charlie said, don't get so tied up in the eclipse, that you, in the photography that you don't see the eclipse. 
and the automation is a great way if you trust your equipment and have practiced with it that you just let the camera do its thing and you observe the eclipse through binoculars or something like it. Okay, I would like to get people's comments on what we should do next. Uh, I think we can go into more detail on astrophotography, but uh, potentially that's a very deep and complex topic. And I don't think we can really teach you what you need to know to do the astrophotography because what you're going to do is depends on the kind of equipment you have, the kind of equipment you want to get, um, and what kind of pictures you want to get, and how much effort you want to put in to doing that. Uh, we can go over some of the things like how to how to pick the focal length of the camera and what you can expect to see based on focal length, uh, where you go for references for exposure time. Um, by the way, I'm. Oh yeah, let me talk about this a little bit. This is these are my pictures from 2017. I made a mosaic, um, and it just illustrates what happens with a range of exposure times. It also illustrates what happens when you have a lens that doesn't have the greatest focus stability. Um, so these are not particularly sharp, but going from very short exposures to the longest I figured I could do. Um, you see different parts, you see different parts of the corona all the way from the prominences out. And I haven't tried to do a uh, high dynamic range processing, but the thing that sort of amused me the most is this is a detail, the lower right's a detail of this picture with the longest exposure. And what you're seeing is the Maria and, uh, and Highlands on the moon illuminated by the earth as the moon passes in front of the sun. So it's an extreme case of what, what's called around new moon, the, the new moon and the old moon's arms or vice versa, where you can see the, the surface of the moon illuminated by the earth. Well, the same thing happens during an eclipse, although if you have scattered light from the sun, it becomes tricky. Uh, but what I was trying to do is close this out. This is effectively the fourth edition of Fred Espinach's book, Mark Littman and Fred Espinach. Uh, and this was done for 2017. Uh, they say there's a new one coming out for 2024. It won't be too much different. But this is a very good reference for uh, exposure times. One of the things he did between this edition and the previous editions is he previously is he had previously talked a lot about film photography, Littman and Espinach. Uh, but in this edition, they talk primarily about digital photography. Uh, and there are discussions of the appropriate exposure times. And of course, the appropriate exposure time as a function of ISO hasn't changed. It's it's the same, even though the technology by which you take the pictures has changed. So um, I, th I think it's a good investment even before the new edition comes out. Uh, the biggest difference would be he doesn't have as much detailed information about the 2024 eclipse specifically. He's talking mainly about 2017. But I think the description of the history of solar eclipse observation and solar eclipse science and the sections on photography are very good. Uh, if you look at the resource page on the website, we've listed some other sources of eclipse photography exposure information. So you can get an idea of what, you, uh, what you'll what you have to do. Um, other than that, I, I would like to hear from people what they'd like to hear uh, for future sessions. And we can try to we can try to put an emphasis on what people want to hear. So I'd like to open it up for comments. Uh, Alan, I have a couple of comments. Hi, um, in the May um, Sky and Telescope issue, there was a review of the Star Adventure GTI, which I read. It indicated that um, it looked like it was a very promising 
um, mount if one wanted to purchase one for the eclipse. It made an, um, um, a reference to the fact that it was a little difficult to find how to uh, deal with the alignment and the um, um, position and application of the automated features when you're viewing the sun. But on the other hand, it looked like it was kind of a once package solution to the difficulties of alignment and following the sun over an extended period of time. Uh, I, for one, would be interested in hearing anybody's comments about that, whether they uh, think that this is a good idea or not a good idea to have um, for photography, and this is specifically for photography and for small telescopes. Um, um, so in terms of specifically this piece of equipment and maybe other preferential pieces of equipment to use if you're planning to go and observe the eclipse, that, that would be a valuable topic, I think, to uh, consider. The other idea I had and perhaps it was in your it's in your planning is that in term to me one of the challenges of trying to do photography during an, a total solar eclipse which i tried on successfully to do years ago uh, in 2017 is finding the sun aligning it given the the problems that you have with respect to, you don't want to stare right at the sun. It struck me as um, perhaps useful if there was some practice session or sessions that uh, the, the club could sponsor to specifically photograph the sun. If there were some say in several months, bring your equipment, bring, here's some things to use. Those of you who have had experience in actually aligning your equipment to the sun, setting, doing camera settings, doing, um, working with telescopes, when you're observing the sun, there's so much as, and rel with respect to astronomy that's associated with the dark sky and the techniques that are associated with that. I think there is much less associated with the sun, but frankly, when you're observing an eclipse, most of the time it's the sun you're trying to deal with and then trying to figure out how to deal with the dynamic range associated with its complete uh, extinction, almost a complete extinction in illumination and set some do something with your equipment, knowing what to do with your equipment in order to take um, uh, credible photography, photographic images like you were just presenting a, a few minutes ago. So um, I think for someone who hasn't done it or hasn't done it successfully, um, learning how among, you know, from people who have done it before, how to take images of the sun uh, and what you need to do, what you need to worry about um, and how to do it successfully would be a great thing from my perspective, at least anyway, to, to, for the group to, to um, do something about. Okay, well, I just, um, you know, I just put down a note to self in the chat, uh, which other people could do too to, for ideas, but what you're just saying that basically have a session on on polar alignment on pointing at the sun and uh and and focus too um before the before the main event so that you're not panicked when when totality happens right and uh, and that's that's probably worth a session uh including some specific equipment that has worked and and hasn't uh i know at the last one i used a solar a um a polar tracker um an ioptron which which i bought from Dan, which was one of the wonderful pieces of equipment I've gotten from Dan. <laughs> About 90%, but 
wonderful equipment um uh, that work gangbusters and uh, and track the sun just fine and i and i had a trick for aligning it of course the the best thing you can do is get there the night before and, and do a polar alignment on on the stars but usually that's not an option um but um so there are tricks with that and there are tricks uh without it um, you know if you're just there on the day of or you can't leave your equipment out um uh, so i think yeah we could address that you could try to round up some of the people who've taken pictures and see what they've done greg did you have something you wanted to ask or suggest i was going to suggest that um it's it's not just those one or two or three things there's a lot of different obstacles you run into for example I set up my mount uh, in practice and realized I couldn't read my hand controller. You couldn't see it in the sun. It was an astrophysics uh, hand controller built for the dark. And so I had to get a towel and stick it in, in and, and uh, be able to read it. So that was difficult. Uh, when I tried to focus with the DSLR, I realized in the sun I couldn't see the image. So I ended up having to get one of those Hoodman hoods and got it magnified and that solved the problem. Uh, but then you've got to, then you're like a one arm paper hanger trying to hold that and make the adjustments and doing all this stuff at the same time. And so you find that you need some straps to keep it on there or they sell this magnetic frame that it will stay on your, your equipment. So I, I think I think he's absolutely right that there is uh, a whole litany of small challenges that you have to overcome for solar photography that makes it just mandatory that you have some practice sessions. If not with the group, that that will be difficult to get everybody together to do that, but it will be worthwhile. Uh, certainly uh, by yourself, it's. Uh, uh, in, incredible. Uh, that little um, solar finder uh, that Charlie had in his video, that was the result, I, I think he said of a, uh, oh, what do you call it? The uh, 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 3D printer. 3D printer. Thank you. Um, they make a, a steel version of that. Um, uh, Teleview does, and they call it the soul finder. And that's one of the few that works, but you have to figure out how to mount it. And uh, if you don't already have a mounting solution, then you've got to figure out one. Yeah, uh, this, but, this is Charlie. Uh, I actually bought that uh, on eBay for $9. And the reason I bought it was because it would mount into my, uh, uh, my uh, flash shoe. Yeah, that was a great idea. And uh, um, that was that was the sole reason I bought that. <laughs> uh, Paul Severance is continually suggesting that we look for projects that can be handled by some of the people in the uh, in the three D printing SIG, which Novak also has. So if someone were to find on uh, on the maker sites the um, the specification for something like that, there are probably some people who would uh, who would uh, crank out a few of them that people could use for solar photography. And, um, you know, it, although $9 is not bad for anything that's fabricated, um, the, and, and of course the viewing problem, some people just, just put a towel over their head, but, um, yeah, you got to hold it in place. And that, um, that can get tricky. and that's, and that's <laughs> unique to each piece of equipment. Right. Uh, I noticed in in I think Jeff's photograph in, in Jeff's video, one of the telescopes there, someone had made what looked like a, a screen just to keep the whole back end of the telescope in shade so that you could work there. Um, I don't know if that was enough so you could read the LED screen and or read the the um, the hand controller, but the general problem of trying to operate things when the sun is intentionally bright and and you're not used to your equipment in daylight uh, 
is is useful and maybe just the idea of making a a, a simple shade for the back side it probably also helps to keep the camera well it won't be so much of a problem in april but uh in august keeping the equipment cool uh, was an issue in direct sunlight normally you wouldn't let it sit out there for three hours at a time but um yeah if it's only the front end that's sticking out that would be a good thing so yeah there are a lot of tips and tricks like that um and Charlie I, I, didn't mention it, but uh, reading the computer screen, if you're dependent on a computer program, is also an issue. But he yes. had a tub turned sideways, which I assume that he used in order to provide the shade for that uh, and also keep the uh, the uh, laptop out of the sun. So you're right. There are all sorts of things uh, to consider. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing although roundtables are a little bit difficult in Zoom meetings, but that's sort of what we want is a um, uh, an, an idea session where people talk about what they did that worked and what they did that didn't work. I had that problem in 2017 and I ended up putting my, excuse me, putting my computer inside the car and I was going back and forth between them to keep it um, um so I could just see the computer screen and and know the time and schedule and, and what I was anticipating doing um, and keeping track of some other things. Luckily, my, my exposures didn't critically depend on it. But um, yeah, I couldn't read my screen in sunlight. It was so. Uh, I'd like to offer something else. I am very interested in these automation programs that we keep referring to sort of nebulously as, you know, not, not well supported, not supported anymore. It sure be nice to learn the details associated with that. Um, are there details at the, at the references that you've provided at the websites? I, I have started to it. What I wanted, my, my objective is not just to throw a bunch of, spaghetti on the wall in that reference document and it's really just one document now but to get some sort of some sort of curation and to have people comment on what they know about these products um the american astronomical society uh because they want to be even-handed lists lots of stuff and they don't necessarily comment on the quality of the items and they're they're definitely not listing junk and they are trying to put only worthwhile things on there but you really in the case of the software you pretty much have to go to each site and see what the current status is of uh, of the item and um see what the vendors claim to do and at some point somebody's going to have to download them now a lot of them are free or nearly free so it's not a big effort to check them out, but everything takes a little time. So um, the more curated comments we can get on products, uh, and right now there is not a section on helpful hints, but there could be. Now, a lot of the things that come up as helpful hints are things that are well-documented. And if you get one or two good books, it'll be covered and it'll be covered in a consistent way. Of course, everybody expects to find everything on the web now, not in books, but, but there are still good authors who will put things together in, uh, in a consistent and coherent way so that it's actionable as opposed to just a bunch of factoids. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's a long answer to, but uh, to, uh, if people have creative comments, constructive comments on the various products, either that they've tried or that they're willing to try, that would help. And I'm gonna to try to put as much of it together as possible. Right now it's only about three pages or four pages, primarily of URLs and some book references. Um, but as people send me comments, I'll, I'll add more things to it generally pointers to experts. I, I don't want a lot of narrative there, but uh, this is something which provides, you know, a, a comment that says, I looked at this product or this item 
it is good about this topic. And not everything's good about everything, but uh, there are a few things that people should know about. So I have, I annotated the book, the totality book on that site. And there's one particular online resource for exposure calculations. I don't remember the name. That's also commented as being worthwhile. And um, Dan and Chris Kage had done some of this as they prepared the one sheet for the annular eclipse. They, they put some of the references on there. So we'll try to build it up. And then we can have a real time thing at, uh, at one of the future sessions. I think next session, we'll try to, um, uh, Craig just showed something. Next session, we'll try to, I'll, I'll try to continue and go over an overview of, um, of what's to be photographed. Greg, I can't read the title. Solar, so, total well, solar who, eclipse. Who's is it? It's Espinac. Oh, Espinac and Anderson. Okay. Anderson. And my only only comment is that it's it's not it's not uh, particularly helpful on the details of the actual photography. It is primarily a primer about where to go, what the timing of the eclipse is, how to watch an eclipse, and there is a short section in the back for references. But it it was not exactly what I was expecting because I'd already done the homework and figured out where I'm going to be. So I didn't need that part, uh, but it's still a, a good book. And he comes out with this total solar eclipse. It's called the uh, Eclipse Bulletin for the 2024 eclipse. Um, I didn't find it particularly helpful because I'd already found most of the information that I needed online. Yeah, uh, and Jay, Jay Anderson's stuff is all online already. And that reference, is is in my listing and i think espinac has covered the the overall Lit, litman and espinac have covered both visual and photographic observing in the book so um i and i think espinac in particular has figured out that you put out the same information in 12 different forms because everybody wants to look at it in a slightly different way uh, but Espinac's strength is on calculating um, where the eclipse will be visible and predict and, and those predictions. And that was his career as a dynamicist. Um, but he's um, uh, Javier, um, I forgot the name, a French guy, has an automated, has an, uh, uh, a dynamic map where you put your cursor down anywhere and it tells you all the precise circumstances of the eclipse at that point duration azimuth elevation start time stop time all of that so um the dynamic map has eliminated the need for a lot of printed tables basically you just you just point to the places you might be interested in and uh everything you need to know about the appearance of the eclipse is right there. So, um, yeah. um, we had a couple of people who have raised their hands, John Birch and then Jeff Ball. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jeff, why don't you, why don't you start and I'll go to John. Alan, uh, just to kind of tag on to what Greg was asking for is I think we're still early in the game. We're probably going to have some new players come into this image capturing field. And I would be shocked if ZWO does not do something specifically around orienting their um, ASI ZWO image capture software to have a solar eclipse capturing um, sequence automated for their cameras and Canon cameras. Um, okay. So I think, I think it's still early. That's why I've not really dove into this. But like uh, Charlie said, I'm probably still magic lantern, assuming nothing else changes. But I think we give this two or three more months here and we might see a whole different playing field coming. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my preliminary observation depends on what kind of a computer you have and whether you want it to be entirely within the Canon, for example, the Canon camera. Um, there's adequate stuff there now. It's just that more 
people would be able to automate their equipment. I think Nikon control is somewhat underrepresented. Um, I think people understand that the astronomical community is primarily Canon and a bunch of Nikons and then nothing else. And I, I did make the mistake in 2017, I had a Samsung camera, which had no support from anybody. And um, it, it was a mistake to buy it. It's a good camera for many things, but not for astronomy. Um, so yeah, there'll be there'll be more stuff coming up, but people had better get their software out pretty soon if it's going to be primarily reviewed by the magazines in time for anybody to buy it. I, th I think that's what's needed, or at least reviewed on cloudy nights. Um, and um, yeah, so there'll be more solutions, especially if you don't want to drag. A, it's interesting if you don't want to drag a computer because. Um, getting to the eclipse with all that stuff is is a problem and one of the nice things about uh, i know that um, um charlie he had basically a, a pretty lightweight setup but he did have the advantage of driving so flying is different uh john you had something you wanted to add i was thinking it uh, might be logistically practical to have uh, a, an uncurated and a curated site uh, referring to one another so that everybody who has an idea or a suggestion or a question could post on the uncurated site and the cream of that could be um, moved to a permanent location in, in the curated site. Yeah. Um, well, right now we don't have a site. We only have a document because I don't have access to an easy way to, to post a, a uh, uh, a page, a website. I, I I know how to do it, but I'm not going to start doing that. Um, and I'm also not going to do an uncurated effort. Um, if other people want to do that, that's fine. But I only want to put stuff up on the reference page, which I can say is worth looking at. Um, if If other people want to go and have a list of things that should be reviewed by someone else, that's fine, but that's uh, that's a lot of effort for a, for a small return. I'd like to know things which are worthwhile, and and just put that up for starters. I just yeah, I guess I was thinking of something like a, a even a a, a a Facebook group or something like that, where everybody could ask questions and they, and that would cut down on the work that you might do to to do the curation of things that people thought were useful. Well, but, but maybe that's yeah. maybe that's being done on cloudy nights. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, one more Facebook group isn't going to solve the problem. I don't think. I don't think Facebook groups solve many problems anyway. But that's that's my opinion. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, if you want to start that and you know, see if anybody, see if anybody joins up, uh, you know, I can point people to them. Say here's here's a place to uh, to put your questions or or answers, but I preferred curate, curated content as being worthwhile. No, that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Um, it's it's already after nine. I appreciate people hanging in. Um, this discussion has gone long, but uh, I, I appreciate it. I, some guidance for what's coming up. So um, we have one other speaker who who offered to talk about citizen science and that'll be uh either may or june or something uh i gotta contact him again and um, he's going to talk about some of the timing opportunities with the eclipse which is a, a different dynamic so i'll i'll put these things together and um uh pamela and chris pamela does a lot of editing of this video so this whole thing will get posted. Uh, Chris Kage posts it on YouTube so everybody can get it. And um, the references will be on, on the uh, Novak Drive. So again, I thank Jeff for his contribution and his, his uh, presentation and uh, Charlie and everybody who, who joined the discussion. Um, I do look forward um, if, if Jeff, studies the problem some more 
and, and has new views of what to get ready for the next one. Uh, I think I'd love to have him back, talk to us again. Um, and even if it just shows us some more videos, that'd be great too. Uh, and I do recommend you go to his site. He's, he's got good stuff. Uh, and anytime, if you have suggestions of, of content for the sessions, please send them to me and uh, try to work on them and get them included. Uh, our attendance this time was a little bit light. I didn't send out the, today's reminder until very late. I apologize for that. I'll try to do better next time. So with that, I think I'd like to wish everybody a good evening and thanks for your help. And see you next month. See you at Outreach this weekend and next weekend. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Alan.